Hola amigos, buenas tardes. Les saluda Norberto Sánchez, cirujano HPV, jefe de cirugía del Hospital Ángeles Puebla y orgulloso miembro fundador de nuestra asociación. Para mí es un gusto presentarles a los profesores participantes de nuestro siguiente debate titulado Resección arterial en cáncer de páncreas. En este interesante debate contaremos con la participación de muy queridos amigos de nuestra asociación, cirujanos expertos, líderes de opinión en sus distintos países. Por orden de aparición, la primera ponencia quedará a cargo del doctor Mark Trudy, experimentado cirujano oncólogo HPV, adscrito al servicio de cirugía hepatobiliar y páncreas de la clínica Mayo en Rochester, Minnesota, quien nos expondrá sus argumentos a favor de la resección arterial en cáncer de páncreas. A continuación, la segunda ponencia del debate correrá a cargo del doctor Bernardo Franzen, brillante especialista en cirugía oncológica, HPV y de invasión mínima, adscrito al Hospital Rupert St. Francis de la ciudad de Charleston, en Carolina del Sur, quien nos presentará sus argumentos en contra de la resección arterial como parte del tratamiento quirúrgico del cáncer de páncreas. Al término de ambas exposiciones, se llevará a cabo una mesa redonda de rica discusión, en donde además de los brillantes ponentes, no se enriquecerán con sus puntos de vista tres extraordinarios cirujanos más que presentaré a continuación. El doctor Scott Helton, personalidad en el mundo del HPV, querido amigo de nuestra asociación y director del Centro de Excelencia en Cirugía de Hígado, Páncreas y Vías Biliares del Virginia Mason Medical Center en Seattle, Washington. El doctor Peter Kim, cirujano en trasplantes y cirugía patobiliar, adscrito al Hospital General de Vancouver y a la Universidad de British Columbia en Vancouver, Canadá. Y por último, todos conocemos al doctor Ismael Domínguez, extraordinario cirujano académico, importante pilar de nuestra asociación, quien es cirujano oncólogo HPV, adscrito al servicio de cirugía de HPV del Instituto Nacional de Nutrición en la Ciudad de México, quien además fungirá como coordinador de la mesa de discusión. Pues bien amigos, muchas gracias por su atención, reciban mis mejores deseos y a disfrutar nuestro congreso. Hello, uh, my name is Mark Trudy, and I've been asked to discuss arterial resection in pancreatic cancer. Uh, to begin the talk, I just want to make sure uh, what tumors we're talking about today. We're not talking about the borderline resectable tumors where there is only a partial abutment of the artery, but specifically in today's talk, we're talking about those patients who have tumors that uh, encase the artery greater than 180 degrees. The so-called locally dominant phenotypes. And these are the one third of patients that are deemed inoperable because of this arterial encasement. Uh, historically, these patients have uh, a virtual 100% of positive margin with a standard surgical technique. They've historically had severe morbidity and mortality after such operations and have had minimal survival benefit with an upfront resection. However, we do know that there is a subset of these patients that are relatively attenuated biologically based on autopsy, observational, and mutational studies. And therefore, they have more of a local regional rather than metastatic phenotype. And the question is, are there surgical options for such patients? So why are we even talking about this? Why are we talking about arterial resection? Because things have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. So the first major change has been the advent of effective systemic chemotherapy. Traditionally, we only had single agent therapies with very poor response rates. However, starting in 2011 uh, and moving forward, we now have uh, multiple combinatorial regimens such as fulfirinox, gemabraxane, plus or minus cisplatin, and we're seeing significant responses and survival in the neoadjuvant setting. Second, we're coming to realize the benefit of preoperative neoadjuvant chemoradiation, a variety of different modalities where this radiation targets not just the tumor, but all the surrounding at-risk structures. And we know that patients who undergo preoperative chemoradiation have a significant decrease in their margin positive rates and their node positive rates. And therefore, there is an indirect survival benefit. And finally, we've become better surgeons. We've taken techniques such as unblocked vascular and multivisceral resection from other tumor types and are now starting to apply them in pancreas cancer. We've also learned how to uh, identify and mitigate post-pancreatectomy complications, as well as manage significant endocrine, exocrine, and nutritional consequences of these operations. So what is the surgeon's oncologic contribution to the patient? Well, there are two primary uh, concerns. One, you need a safe operation with reasonable mortality, morbidity, and long-term quality of life. And it also has to be effective. We know the benefit of a margin negative resection, In this day and age, a key thing is to prevent local recurrence, and also these options should be potentially curative. 
So what are the options that we have after modern neoadjuvant therapy? Well, four of them are listed here. They could either have no surgery, which is standard, non-resectional, where patients uh, undergo exploration and either intraoperative radiation or new uh, modalities such as IRE. Then we have a recent concept of periarterial divestment. And all three of these will talk briefly towards the end, but I've been asked to talk about unblock arterial resection. So historically, arterial resection has always been considered taboo. Very few centers perform them at very low frequency. Uh, this was a global meta-analysis published in 2011. Uh, at that time, only 300 patients underwent unblocked resection compared to those who did not. Those patients who underwent unblocked arterial resection had significantly worse major morbidity, 14% 30-day operative mortality, and also worse one, three, and five-year survival. However, this paper was published prior to the modern effective chemotherapeutics. Uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, we have the largest U.S. experience with unblock arterial resections, having performed over 200 cases, and there's been a dramatic increase since 2010. Uh, shown here, uh, as dated as of December 2019, uh, the distribution of arteries that we've resected, uh, primarily hepatic, a lot of celiac recently, and then SMA. Now, tumors, these are the arteries that we're talking about. Tumors can involve the hepatic artery. They can involve the common, the proper, and a variety of reconstruction techniques, either end-to-end -end anastomosis, saphenous vein grafts, transposition, or autologous grafts. Patients can also have involvement of replaced vessels, replaced right or replaced common vessels. Again, a variety of different reconstruction techniques. Tumors can also involve the superior mesenteric artery. In these patients, they require an unblock segmental resection, uh, and in our practice, typically we use an autologous SFA graft or a cryopreserved cadaveric graft to revascularize the viscera. Patients can also have tumors involving the SMA and a replaced vessel. These require dual revascularization to the hepatic and to the SMA, uh, typically with some sort of, of conduit graft, shown here with cadaveric grafts. Tumors can also encase the celiac axis. This is one of our specialties uh, here specifically. And if you take one thing home from this talk today, this is not an Appleby. In 1953, Dr. Appleby described celiac resection for gastric cancer, in which patients underwent a gastrectomy with a distal pancreatectomy and unblocked celiac resection, with the liver being perfused via collaterals from the SMA. In 1992, Takanaka described a modified version of this because the patients didn't have adequate collaterals. This was the modified Appleby. Both the Appleby and modified Appleby are gastric cancer operations. They're not pancreas cancer operations because there are completely different concerns in terms of gastric ischemia when we're talking about pancreas cancer. The first celiac resection for pancreas cancer was performed in 1976 first series in 1997, then in 2007, a new moniker, DP CARS. Last year, there was a multi-site global paper, 15 major centers across the globe, total of 176 cases. They defined a high volume center as more than one case per year, and only three centers in that study qualified. That's again, to suggest the overall rarity of such operations. What all these studies do have in common is these operations are associated with high morbidity and mortality, primarily thrombosis, ischemia, and hemorrhage. Most of these, patient, patient, uh, these cases had low revascularization rates with a variable survival. And all of them typically described only distal pancreatectomy with resection of the celiac axis proper only, with no consideration or descriptions of operations for tumors that go beyond the celiac. We have had a significant increase in celiac axis resections in Rochester. Uh, we published our, our series last year, 90 total celiac axis resections. And as you can see, uh, the frequency per year has increased quite dramatically in the modern chemotherapy era. And we've created a classification system. So class one tumors encase the celiac axis proper only in the trifurcation. There are subclassifications, class 1A, these are your standard celiac resection relying on collaterals to perfuse both the stomach and the liver. These can also be performed laparoscopically. Class 1B, when there is inadequate collaterals, these patients require uh, hepatic arterial revascularization with gastric preservation. And then class 1C, when there are inadequate gastric perfusion, uh, they require hepatic revascularization along with total gastrectomy. 
The second class includes tumors that involve the celiac and extend laterally to include the GDA and the proper hepatic artery. In these particular cases, the stomach cannot be preserved and thus patients need to undergo a total gastrectomy. If the pancreatic head and bile duct are not involved, they can undergo a subtotal pancreatectomy with hepatic arterial revascularization. If the pancreatic head and bile duct are involved, they undergo total pancreatectomy, total gastrectomy with hepatic artery revascularization as shown here in these uh, operative photos. And then finally, class three tumors are tumors that involve the celiac and extend inferiorly to the SMA. Class 3A, it does not involve the GDA proper or pancreatic head. And in these patients, they can undergo a subtotal distal pancreatectomy uh, with both celiac and SMA resection with dual revascularization, a plus or minus gastric uh, preservation depending on inflow. And then finally, uh, the largest tumors, class 3B, tumors that involve the celiac, extend laterally to the GDA and proper, as well as extend inferiorly to the SMA. Uh, these patients require total pancreatectomy, total gastrectomy, unblock resection of all the uh, celiac, SMA, often, oftentimes the vein with dual revascularization. Now, what are the limitations of such operations? These are very difficult. They're truly bespoke operations. There's no real names for them. Uh, the tumor one centimeter in either direction can change the uh, operative complexity. There are increased risk compared to standard cases. Uh, these primarily include hemorrhagic, ischemic, and infectious complications. The 90-day mortality in our hands has significantly improved uh, to 4% over the last 50 cases. And because of these increased risks, it's only appropriate after effective therapy. And that's the key point. As our operations get more and more complex, uh, the operative risks increase. Therefore, we need to justify these risks with any potential oncologic benefit. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is we have to understand what is our endpoint, what is our product? My wife makes the best chocolate chip cookies. This is her ingredients. I've tried to make them before. I can't make her cookies, why not? Because she knows how to take the right ingredients in the right order and the right amount to get the product that she's looking for. So what's the product we're looking for in these patients specifically? Well, it's not an operation. Our product or our endpoint is to increase their life expectancy and maintain reasonable quality of life, period. An operation can be critical to achieve these goals or it can decrease the likelihood of both. So how do we improve the odds for our patients? Well, we do something called parlay, where we take a small, something of small value and turn it into an incrementally greater value, sort of like the lottery. In sports, a parlay is a bet on one or two or more teams that are dependent on all teams winning. So for example, if I were to bet on the uh, Mexican national soccer team to beat the US soccer team and they won, I would only get paid out one to one. But if I bet on the Mexican national team to beat all three teams, both US, USA, Costa Rica, Honduras, and they all win, I get a higher payout, a seven to one. So what are we parlaying in pancreas cancer? Well, these are the three things, responsivity, reconstructability, and recoverability. Start with responsivity. This is critical because our greatest threat in pancreas cancer is occult metastases. Therefore, if we are giving these patients neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we have to have an objective measure that it's effective. Traditionally, we relied on CT scans. However, a tumor that encases an arterial structure is never going to recede. That just does not happen. We have to also get some sort of a biochemical response in the patients that do it at elevated tumor markers. And most importantly, what we've incorporated in our practice is using metabolic or PET response. And this is typically the only way we can really tell if what we're giving is, is effective. Why does this matter? Because response to chemotherapy equals survival. And therefore, we need to maximize the preoperative response. And this is both chemotherapy and tumor biology dependent. Second, reconstructability. The goal is to come up with an operation to perform a margin, margin negative resection of all at-risk tissues. This is critical because in the advent of good systemic therapy, we need to prevent a local recurrence, which is probably going to be a surgical quality indicator moving forward. And in terms of restruct, uh, reconstructability, I typically use what we consider for hepatic resectability. You need to reestablish end organ arterial venous inflow and outflow and restore gastrointestinal biliary continuity. 
If this can be accomplished with an operation, that patient is reconstructable. This is both surgeon and anatomy dependent. And finally, recoverability. We have to understand the increased risks of complications, mortality, post-operative quality of life, and whether the patient can tolerate such a thing or wants to tolerate some, something like that. And this is completely patient dependent. So how do we get there? Well, we get there through the whole process of total neoadjuvant therapy, where we do induction chemotherapy, consolidative chemoradiation, and then an aggressively, a selectively aggressive operation. This has been the basis of many trials. It's currently a guideline for those patients with borderline locally advanced pancreas cancer. And we last year recently described our experience of about 200 patients undergoing such treatment. And here are the oncologic outcomes. The overall survival for the entire cohort was just under five years. Arterial resection, which was a third of those patients, was not at all detrimental for survival. Only three things dictated how long people lived. These are shown here on multivariable analysis. Those patients who normalized their CA99 with chemotherapy lived longer. Those patients who had more chemotherapy prior to surgery lived longer. And those patients who had a major pathologic response lived longer. And the final one, the major pathologic response, that was the most uh, significant predictor. Now, normally we would not know this until after the operation. And this is where we've come to use new advances to predict pathologic response. And in these locally advanced tumors, we use PET scans, specifically PET MRI, to know if chemotherapy is effective. If you can achieve a metabolic response that highly predicts pathologic response. And my goal is to remove a dead tumor, because if that tumor is dead, likely any systemic disease that they may have is also dead. So are there other options other than an unblocked arterial resection? Yes, as we said earlier. Well, you could have no surgery. You could have these non-resectional procedures, or finally, these new concept of divestment techniques. So no surgery. Uh, I have no problem with that approach. So shown here are the outcomes for patients with locally advanced unresectable tumors undergoing chemotherapy and chemoradiation alone. And as you can see that over time, their median survival has increased, meaning that our chemotherapy and radiation has become quite effective with the most recent meta-analysis of a two-year median survival. That is the expected median survival for a resectable pancreas cancer after surgery. Therefore, if we're gonna consider surgery, our new comparator has to be a survival of greater than two years. Uh, the second uh, type of treatment that's been described is these non-resectional where patients undergo an exploration and then they either go intraoperative radiation or IRE. Now, I don't particularly approve of this method. This is truly non-curative. Uh, these are associated with complications. And regardless of what people say, intraoperative radiation and IRE is not completely ablative, meaning it does not kill everything. There may be some partial benefit. And in my opinion, at best, this is equal to an R2 resection, which is of questionable survival benefit. I would only consider such an, an option for patients that are truly unresectable, such as this uh, CT scan here, in which there are absolutely no reconstructive options. And then finally, I want to talk quickly, briefly, on this new concept of periarterial divestment. Uh, this was first described uh, by the Germans in Heidelberg. Uh, Hopkins recently had talked about this in a new paper. And this is a concept where patients undergo an exploration. And shown here on this picture, uh, the tumor is essentially cut in half, and the tumor is skeletonized off the artery. In some cases, they even perform a subadventitial plane of the artery in order to not have to resect and reconstruct. Uh, there are multiple issues here. Uh, one of the reasons this was described because authors have suggested that intraoperative biopsy suggested that a lot of this tissue is non-viable. Now, if our path responses were 70, 80, 90% of complete path response, I don't think this is unreasonable. Unfortunately, our complete path responses in even the most recent best studies is only 10 to 20%. Thus, by cutting through the tumor, you're violating all oncologic principles, potentially seeding the resection cavity, and most likely you're leading, leaving tumor on the vessel that's now potentially been injured. If we look at local recurrence in resectable tumors, so we have good data for this on adjuvant trials. So the local recurrence in resectable cancers is still 40%. It must be significantly higher in tumors that actually involve these vessels. 
uh, 30% of patients present with it isolated local recurrences. And these were two studies where they looked at the area. Where do these local recurrences uh, occur? 90% of them occur within three centimeters of the origin of the celiac and SMA for tumors that do not involve the celiac or SMA. And to somehow suggest that tumors that do involve the celiac SMA that we wouldn't try to resect all this is nonsensical. And ultimately what happens is this, these are the outcomes. And this is what we're starting to see more and more often to patients that underwent these divestment techniques where the surgeon tried to skeletonize the vessel, you could see the clips and then the local recurrence. And now they're sent to us to try to salvage, which unfortunately are rarely salvageable. So a final outgoing message, there are surgical options that exist for pancreas cancer with arterial encasement. A surgical option should be curative, it should be oncologically sound, and it should minimize local recurrence. We do know that arterial resection is associated with increased risks that should only be formed at high volume centers with experience and only in highly selected patients after total neoadjuvant therapy. And finally, the whole concept of resectability is meaningless in this modern era, and we should start focusing more on responsivity, reconstructability, and recoverability. Thank you very much. Good day to all of you. My presentation today is entitled Arterial Resection in Locally Advanced Pancreatic Cancer. Today, I will be presenting the viewpoint against arterial resection. I am Dr. Bernardo Franzen. I am oncologist, uh, surgeon, and HPV specialist in Robert St. Francis Hospital in Charleston, South Carolina. I will be sharing with you my bias from my viewpoint, I was trained basically in high specialty centers, first in nutrition with Dr. Mercado and Dr. Chan, then in Mount Sinai in New York, and then Mayo Clinic, where I was able to work with Dr. Trudy. All these hospitals are particularly interested in uh, HPV surgery. However, now I am working in a smaller hospital with a, a good multidisciplinary team, but this is a reference center within uh, South Carolina. I would like now to talk about uh, Dr. Trudy, the, the, who is presenting the position in favor in a website uh, published in Mayo Clinic. He was called the Dragon Slayer talking about pancreatic cancer as the dragon. For the time I have known Dr. Trudy, I have never seen him lose a debate or a discussion. He has outstanding memory and his focus and determination are one of a kind. Now I would like to take this opportunity of the analogy of the dragon and pancreatic cancer because I believe there has been a change in perception of pancreatic uh, surgery over time. 30 years ago, for example, the dragon looked more like the one on the right-hand side of the screen. Hopefully, in the near future, the dragons we will be slaying will be more like the dragon on the left-hand side of the screen. Now, I would like to talk about some uh, general viewpoints about pancreatic cancer. As we know, incidence is growing. In the U.S., it ranks number three in mortality among cancers. And as we all know, it offers the only possibility of cure through surgery. However, only 20% of cases when diagnosed are resectable. Around 30% have uh, locally advanced disease without metastasis. And this is the group of patients that perhaps we can have a positive impact through the use of arterial resections. It is necessary to say that without neoadjuvant therapy, this discussion would not be taking place. It is indispensable in order to arrive at this point. I would like to talk about a couple of papers in this regard regarding neoadjuvant therapy, both written by groups of uh, surgeons. This by Dr. Trudy from Mayo Clinic, where they're looking for predicting response, preoperative outcomes in uh, borderline or locally advanced disease. The only three variables that 
they that had a necessary an impact on the multivariate analysis had to do with tumor and chemotherapy, those variables rather than with the surgery. These three variables were optimum response to value of CA199, having received more than six chemotherapies before surgery, and finally having a greater pathological response at the time of analysis of the specimen by pathology after surgery. In this slide, we see that the more the more these three variables are present in patients, more likelihood of survival, meaning those patients that had these three characteristics that were around 29% in this case, achieved a very good survival, overall survival of 94% at three years, and PFS at 72% at uh, three years, which are very good results. This is a graphic representation of the same information I have just mentioned here. We are able to see how those patients with all three factors represented with the green line have a better survival rate. Those patients without any of these three criteria have a very poor survival. Therefore, this speaks about the type of things we are looking for before deciding operating on a patient with an arterial resection. This study similarly is seeking or looking for resectability predictors for patients with borderline tumors or locally advanced tumors that were treated with new adjuvant therapy from Massachusetts Hospital in the annals of surgery, and they received full Ferenox. Here we see the results that were significant in the multivariate variant analysis. They have to do with the tumor. None of them has to do with the surgery per se. Therefore, these are two clear examples where neoadjuvant therapy is indispensable in order to have an impact on the over uh, the survival of patients either borderline or locally advanced uh, disease. If we are speaking about arterial resection. In reality, what we are talking about is about resectability, and of course, this is implicit. We are looking for a safe resectability with negative margins, giving the patient a cure opportunity. We will now talk about some relevant definitions. To this end, I will talk about the NCCN guidelines that were recently published in October 2020. And uh, I'll talk about what it means, borderline resectability, and particularly regarding arterial resections and in the tumors of the head of the pancreas or the uncinate. This means contact with the common hepatic vein without extension to the bifurcation or celiac trunk with a full resection or safe reconstruction. Or also this may mean to contact of the tumor less than 190 degrees with SMA, super, superior mesenteric artery, or contact with an apparent artery that is a replacement of the right hepatic one. There are some other similar criteria with cancer is in the head of the pancreas or the tail of the pancreas. Now, regarding definition of locally advanced disease, these NCCN guidelines recently published defined the significant parts of arterial resections, such as contact of the tumor with uh, SMA, more than 180 degrees, or contact of the tumor with the celiac trunk, more than 180 degrees. This refers exclusively to tumors of the head of the pancreas and uh, of the uncinate. There are similar uh, descriptions when we're talking about uh, the body of the pancreas or the tail of the pancreas. Interestingly enough, in these guidelines that were recently modified, we see there is an algorithm 
for locally advanced pancreatic cancer in patients with a good functional state. After receiving new adjuvant therapy, not showing disease progression, and they continue with, with good functional status. Therefore, a resection may be considered whenever possible as part of the therapeutic options. This was not a possibility not long ago. Here, the guidelines talk about the resection criteria after new adjuvant therapy. You may have access to look at this in detail. I will talk about particularly those regarding locally advanced tumors. The resectability criteria after new adjuvant therapy in locally advanced disease in a nutshell are the following. This should be a multidisciplinary team decision. There should be no metastatic disease. We should only consider if there is a reduction of at least 50% of CA199. Patients should have a measurable clinical improvement, weight, nutrition, pain, and functional status. Always, always they should be handled in specialized centers. This is not a mistake. Always, always is uh, written in the guidelines in highly specialized centers. The benefit for the long term is unknown. Information is needed. Therefore, this has to be done with caution. Now, regarding the new guidelines in terms of the surgical technique, there is, uh, is mention about pancreatic surgery with arterial resection. In a nutshell, there is lack of evidence to support it, and they should be considered only in very well selected cases. And this may be reasonable then. What is the level of evidence we have to carry out this surgery? The level of evidence is very low. They are small case series, most of them, and there are very few head-to-head -head comparisons. These studies uh, have a lot of bias, publication bias, selection bias, even biases not known by authors that they are trying to reduce through randomization, but there are no randomized studies in this regard. Now, well, we must say that the largest case series I know is the one from Dr. Turi. Therefore, I will not uh, talk about many ca cases, but I would like to talk about the largest case series, that is Dr. Turi's case series. This was published this year, and as you are able to see, this has become larger in terms of cases only in the last two or three years. Before 2016, the cases were less than 10 per year, meaning this is a very new experience, and perhaps it's one of the largest experiences in the world. If you are not doing arterial resection yet, you are not lagging behind. This is very new. Now I will talk about some variables only that will help me to support uh, my viewpoint against arterial resection. In particular, I will talk about uh, this slide highlighting the percentage of patients with total pancreatectomy. 32% of the patients have total pancreatectomy. This means these patients now have deep diabetes and real risk of mortality due to hypoglycemia or some other diabetic complications. We also have another variable, which is the operative time, I mean more than eight and a half hours. And 33% of patients had surgeries that lasted more than 10 hours. If you are going to consider these operations, it is also a true impact on time that we should be willing uh, to do so. 
This slide also, I would like to highlight multivisceral resections, particularly gastrectomies. In this case, we see that 45% of patients require gastrectomy. Perhaps most of them due to the vascularization of the stomach rather than the extension of the tumor. It is a significant percentage of the patients esophagus, eugenostomy, and perhaps and also on top of the total pancreatectomy. This other slide also I want to highlight mortality rate. In the full case series, it was 10%. And uh, in the last cases, this was reduced significantly, only 4%. In the last 50 cases, I would like to celebrate these results. They highlight the learning curve of Dr. Trudy and also, this shows the most recent results, which are very good. However, we see that when we begin with these cases, the mortality rate expected is very high. Finally, I would like to highlight these other variables that have to do with recurrence. As we are able to see, 60% or 69% of uh, recurrent disease were distant, meaning that surgery, even though it is very aggressive, there is no effect on a high percentage of uh, recurrent disease. doesn't matter how perfect our operation is, many of these patients will have recurrent disease uh, at a distant site. What are the comparative studies we have in this regard? The reality is there are very few. I will mention two meta-analyses and systematic reviews that were published recently. And they summarize this very well. This first is a systematic review and meta-analysis published in Germany. I will describe it now. In the end, there were 31 studies that were included in the systematic review. However, only seven of them were comparative studies and were included in the meta-analysis. This is a summary of the results of the systematic review. They include nine countries, 841 arterial resections, and more than 6,000 patients with pancreatectomy without arterial resection. Mortality rate was substantially higher, almost five times higher, in the group of patients with arterial resection. Also, there were more, more pancreatic fistulas, considerably more post-op bleeding. R0 resections were very good, 73% of cases with arterial resection and 80% in the cases without arterial resection. The survival mean was much better in patients compared in comparison with uh, and without arterial resection. This is the information for the meta-analysis. Only seven of the studies, all of them are relatively recent, from 2015 and onwards. We are able to see how time, oper operative time, as well as bleeding, were substantially higher in those with arterial resection. Now, morbidity. Interestingly enough, either in patients with neoadjuvant therapy or without it, was not considerably higher in patients with arterial resection. It was not uh, statistically significant. Mortality, in this case, in these very few studies, was not considerably higher. This is not statistically significant. This other publication, very similar in terms of goals, and it was published practically at the same time, showing relatively different results. This depends a lot on the inclusion criteria. In this case, they included 19 publications. The main difference is that this study included patients since 1989. Therefore, 
the case series are older and this changes a lot the results. That's very interesting, by the way. In this case, 263 patients were included with arterial resection and almost 2,500 patients without it. Variables under study were few, however, uh, the most important ones are depicted here on the slide. Now, the summary of results. Very briefly, I must say that in the meta-analysis, mortality rate was four times higher in patients with arterial resection. Morbidity was a little bit higher, and almost all this morbidity was secondary to bleeding cases. Resections R1 and R2 resections were similar, and the same applies to survival at one year. There was no significant difference when compared with patients that didn't have arterial resection. However, survival at three years was lower in these patients, and that was statistically significant. Now, well, these studies, all of them, have comparisons resection without resection, arterial resection. Say some of them compare with non-resected cases, with palliation, and I will talk about them because they were recently mentioned in the literature. This paper is from uh, Scandinavia by Dr. Del Chiaro. Del Chiaro. He compares patients with borderline disease or locally advanced disease that were resected versus those without resection. As we see on this kaplan mayer curve, survival was better in those re cases that were resected. However, there are very few patients, and when we see the difference of the groups, we can appreciate that the palliation group practically didn't have new adjuvant treatment. Therefore, in reality, I believe this comparison is not fair because the great benefit of survival is given by you know, adjuvant therapy rather than by the surgery. This is another similar example with very few patients, however, showing a significantly better survival in patients with resection with borderline or advanced uh, disease versus those that were not resected. However, the patient, non-resected patients are those that uh, had progression under new adjuvant treatment and they were very weak in order to receive surgery after new adjuvant therapy or those that went to surgery but uh, that could not be resected. In other words, this is a population of patients who are uh, more ill versus the others. Now, well, for those of you who are considering having arterial resection, I think it is indispensable to have a multidisciplinary team and a tumor board to decide what cases should go to surgery or not. Also, we need to have good access to new adjuvant therapy, either radiation or chemotherapy. You need to have also an interventional radiologist around the clock because many of the complications are of vascular nature and also they need to be uh, handled through interventional approach. You need to have advanced endoscopy uh, approach, surgical intensive therapy, HPV experience, vascular surgery support. All of this should be done as part of our research protocol. In other words, a lot of resources are needed and a lot of time is needed to do these surgeries. Therefore, that's why in only very few highly specialized centers this should be considered. Therefore, conclusions. Arterial resections in the case of pancreatic cancer are not the standard of care in advanced disease. Information we have today about survival and the curing possibility are very rare. This surgery has an increase, significant increase in mortality rate and morbidity. 
in most of the publications of recent times. And uh, survival of three years seems to be less versus standard pancreatic resections. Finally, the most important conclusion, I think this should only be done in very well selected cases with a multidisciplinary approach in highly specialized centers and ideally within a research protocol. Finally, I would like to close with a reflection. If a close family member of yours had locally advanced pancreatic cancer, would you accept an operation including total gastrectomy, total pancreatectomy, eugenostomy, knowing the peri-ope risks will be very high and the survival will be less versus standard surgery? The answer for me personally today is very clear. No, a clear no. I would not uh, uh, advise this for one of my family members. Thank you very much. And I, uh, Dr. Melchor, Dr. Zamora, thank you very much. Thanks to all the team with the Mexican HPB Association. I hope we will see all of us in the next uh, year's Congress. Thank you very much.